Good afternoon. Uh, six months ago, Mark started us talking about crossing the chasm. How Ubuntu can get beyond technology enthusiasts and their friends and families to other early adopters. How we can get from somewhere in the region of 12 million users to hundreds of millions of users. How Ubuntu can do for operating systems what Firefox has done for web browsers. So, how do we cross this chasm? Well, you may have your own theory about this, but this is mine. Ubuntu needs to be useful, desirable, gettable, and keepable. Useful in that it does things that people need or want to do. Desirable, people prefer doing those things on Ubuntu rather than any other system. Gettable, people know how to get Ubuntu and install it, or more likely they buy it pre-installed. And keepable, people can keep using Ubuntu for months and years on end without trouble. Now, there's a whole universe of issues and problems that we need to tackle to address these four basic requirements. And if you're working on any of these things, what you're doing is important. So if anyone tells you all Ubuntu needs now is, is games, or all Ubuntu needs now is advertising, they are looking at just a tiny part of this universe. And you'll hear a lot this week about Unity, but the truth is that Unity is only a tiny part of this universe as well. Because Unity will be most successful if it is so simple and unobtrusive that people barely even notice that they're using it. Nobody's going to turn on a computer so that they can use Unity. People turn on a computer so that they can do things. So with that in mind, today I'm just going to look at the first quarter of this chart. How do we make Ubuntu as useful as possible? To some extent, this comes from properties of the base platform. Hardware support, networking, printing, battery life, startup speed, accessibility, things like this. A few of these things we are testing and tracking in an automated way, but most of them we aren't yet. Most of them, whenever they go wrong or whenever they get worse, the only way we find out is by accident, by ad hoc testing. So as Mark said this morning, we should do more automated testing. I look forward to finding out how people here plan to automate more of this testing. The rest of usefulness comes from applications. Applications are what lets people do things with Ubuntu that we could barely imagine. So, how are we doing when it comes to applications? Well, six years ago, the first version of Ubuntu, Ubuntu 4.10, had 375 graphical applications in the standard software channels. And over the past six years, this number has steadily increased pretty linearly. And in Ubuntu 10.10, we have 2,351, approximately. But unlike the real universe, the Ubuntu universe does not exist in a vacuum. Here's Android over the same time period. Two years and one week ago, the Android market started out from zero, and a couple of hours ago, they announced that they have just reached 100,000 applications scale down the graph again, because here's iOS. July 2008, the App Store opened from zero, and today it has over 300,000 applications. This is a big difference. Now, there are several explanations you might make for this difference. You might say, for example, that, well, a lot of those an Android and iOS applications are crap. Right? But that doesn't seem to be true, at least according to Android users themselves, only 28% of the ratings they give to applications are saying that the application is crap. You could say, well, applications don't really matter anymore. Everything is moving to the web. But I don't think that's really true either because that's what Apple thought when they first released the iPhone a few, uh, three years ago. And they pretty quickly realized that it was a mistake because developers didn't like that. And that's what Google thought when they first announced Chrome OS. But it seems to me that Chrome OS has been pretty much sidelined by Android. You might also say the opposite, say, well, a lot of those um, mobile applications are applications specifically to replace particular websites because the websites are so difficult to use on a mobile browser. But that argument doesn't apply to the iPad. The iPad is the dark blue line there. And even that has shot past Ubuntu and now has 35,000 applications after only a few months more than 10 times the number Ubuntu has. Next month, 
Apple is going to open the Mac App Store to application developers. And in the next version of Windows, we can reasonably expect to see a Windows Store as well. We've taken six years to get just over 3,000 applications. How long do you think it will take for them to get 10 times as many? A month? Two months, maybe? There's something terribly wrong here. Now, this does not mean we should give up and go home. It does not mean we should panic. But nor does it mean we should just ignore this problem or say, ah, oh, well, we'll think about that in 2012 or 2013 or 2014. No. We need to figure out what's going wrong now and fix it now. So, what does it take to attract tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of great applications to Ubuntu? Five things. First, we need an initial user base. Of course, this is a bit of a chicken and egg problem, but the more users Ubuntu has, the more those users can give application developers their appreciation or their money or both. And with Ubuntu, we have somewhere in the region of 12 million users who can do this. So far, so good. Second thing we need is a great developer platform. It needs to be not just easy, but even fun to write an Ubuntu application. So how are we doing here? Well, let's look at the websites, for example. This is the website for if you want to write Windows applications. Plenty of information here. This is the website for if you want to write Mac applications. Here's the one for iOS. Here's the one for Android. Here's the one for Palm WebOS. The website for if you want to write Ubuntu applications looks like this. <laughs> but even if this... Even if this site was up and running, what would it say? What would we say, for example, to someone who wanted to add audio to their application? What would we say to someone who wanted to add spell checking to their application? What would we say to someone who wanted to draw a chart inside their application? What does it say that the Unity developers have developed an entire widget toolkit of their own, plus a replacement for one of the standard GNOME libraries, just so that they could implement things that should have been easy already? We're in bad shape here. Ubuntu became popular with millions of end users partly because we made smart, opinionated decisions about which applications to ship by default, and we gave special care and attention to those applications. If we're going to be successful with application developers, we need to put just as much effort into frameworks and APIs. How might we do that? I don't know, but I want to find out. Third thing we need is easy software packaging. In Ubuntu, we have a team of 161 universe contributors who spend their spare time packaging software, mostly other people's software. Now, why do we do that? Well, it's because we're a Linux distribution, and that's what Linux distributions do, right? Yes, but why do they do that? Two main reasons. Firstly, because until now, every Linux distribution has been so unpopular that Hardly any application developers actually cared whether their software was easily installable on that distribution. So the distribution developers had to take up the slack. Fortunately, Ubuntu is now popular enough that this is starting to change. But the second reason is that packaging software for Ubuntu is a lot more difficult than packaging software for Windows. So for everyone here who has ever packaged software, the first thing I'd like you to think about is how can we make this easier? Maybe we need, need to make dip packaging easier. Maybe we need to have a separate package format for third-party applications. Ubuntu universe contributors will play a vital role in Ubuntu for years to come. But if we want to get even 50 times as many applications as we have now, even 50 times as many open source applications, can anyone seriously believe that we'll find 50 times as many universe contributors? Not 160, but 8,000 people? who want to spend their spare time packaging other people's software. So there are several sessions at UDS about this. Fourth thing we need is easy publishing of software. In Ubuntu, the standard process, if you want to get a new application into Ubuntu, takes between two and eight months, depending on what part of the release cycle you had. If 
it's the day before feature freeze, it's two months. If it's the day after feature freeze, it's eight months. Now, in contrast, iOS developers complain if their application doesn't get into the App Store within a week. So we developed two processes to get around this. One is the backports process, the other is the application review process. Neither of them are being used particularly well at the moment. So there are sessions on this this afternoon. The fifth thing we need is easy installation, feedback, and revenue. Here, finally, we get to Ubuntu Software Center. All of this to point out that if you think Ubuntu Software Center is the linchpin of Ubuntu or the future of Ubuntu, you too are looking at just a tiny part of the universe. One month ago, we released Ubuntu Software Center version 3.0. This is a big step forward in several ways. It's faster, it's prettier, the search works better, it uh, lets you install add-ons for applications, it has a history of past transactions, and most importantly, perhaps, it lets you buy software. Right now, we have, I think, two applications in the store, another two on the way. We're looking to accelerate this very quickly. So we owe a big thank you to our amazing team of contributors. If any of you would like to help out with Ubuntu Software Center, please come and talk to one of these people. We're very friendly, and there's lots of things we want to do. Our short-term goal for Ubuntu Software Center 3.1 is ratings and reviews. But beyond that, there are many other things we'd like to do for 4.0. But in the meantime, your homework for today is to think, how can we improve our developer platform? How can we make packaging easier? And how can we make publishing easier? Thank you. All right. I think, aren't you both doing this? Oh, is it just you? Oh, okay. So uh, finally, uh, great job from MBT. Finally, we've got Evan, and he's going to get up and talk about the restaurant at the end of the universe. Big round of applause for Evan. Right, so following Matthew, possibly not my best decision ever. That was quite the presentation. I think that deserves another round of applause for Matthew. Right. So I just want to spend a, a brief period of time today talking to you about where we're at right now where we should be moving towards and, and how we can reduce the barriers and the roadblocks in our path to getting there. So here's where we're at. This should all be quite familiar to all of you, right? We have the upstream developers create applications. They release them out onto the internet. Ubuntu then comes, takes the applications that they find interesting. Individual Ubuntu developers, individual Debian developers take applications, they package them up, they fix all the bugs, that may be there, and they deliver them to users. As Matthew said, this takes anywhere from two to eight months, depending upon where we are in the release cycle. Users, after those two to eight months, get the applications. They play around with them. They find some bugs. They generate some feedback, and they deliver that back up through Ubuntu and back up to the upstream developers. Again, this takes two to eight months plus some time for the users to send that information to us and for us to send that information to developers. This is an incredibly lossy process. There are a wealth of applications out there that we don't even know about because it hasn't piqued anyone's interest in the Ubuntu developer community to actually go ahead and package them. And the individuals writing those applications really have little recourse to getting those applications into Ubuntu. Equally, the bugs that are filed by our users, well, 
there is an immense effort to push these upstream. Not all of them ultimately make it up there. I think no one here has any illusions that all of the bugs that are reported in Ubuntu make their way back up to the upstream applications. So we have a problem. And I've really tried to rack my brain as to what, what we were missing here. And I tried to think, you know, given the apps that we have, what are we missing? What, what, what are the killer applications that, that we use every single day that we're happy to talk to our friends about, that we, we actually go and tell people, oh my god, you've got to try Ubuntu because of this, right? And I really couldn't think of any. Sure, there's, there's Firefox, there's the mail client, and there's a word processor, but really every platform has that. What we don't have is effectively an Angry Birds-like application for Ubuntu, right? Now, whatever you think of this particular game, it's been immensely successful. For those of you that don't know about it, it's generated millions upon millions of dollars in revenue and users mostly through word of mouth. The chief developer of this application was just snatched up by EA, right? And it's a really simple game, and it didn't take very long to develop on the iOS platform, and I'm sure it didn't take quite long either to develop on Android. So taking a, a quick step back, why is this, right? Well, we're spending an awful lot of time doing developers' jobs for them, right? We, we, I said at the beginning, we're taking applications, we're smoothing out the rough edges, we're, we're patching these applications, we're packaging them up, and then we're delivering them to users. But this is actually handicapping developers, right? This is removing that, that direct communication between developers and users. Well, why are we doing this? You know, it, it's obviously costing us a lot of resources, so surely there must be a reason. Well, it turns out the reason is that these are all very dangerous things, and they require years of experience. You know, dpackage runs as root. Equally, maintainer scripts in Debian packages have the full range of options that the shell provides them. So they can do anything on the system. Because they have maintainer scripts, that means they're non-atomic, which means that anything they do can't be undone. So of course we're scared. Of course we'll step in and say, we'll do the packaging for you, because we do not want to introduce our users into that world of hurt of a really bad packaging. But maybe there's another way to solve this, one that's actually scalable. Because if you look at this, as, as Matthew said, you know, if we hope to get to millions of users, uh, hundreds of millions of users, hundreds of thousands of applications, we're not going to be able to do that with the Mo2 alone. Well, what if we introduced static analysis, right? What if we introduced automated processes? If we do the same operation twice, we should be automating it. So let's identify the common problems that people make in packaging, in developing applications, isolate them, and put a layer between them putting, Ubuntu, uh, putting an application forward to Ubuntu and that application reaching users, whereby the package and the software is evaluated through some automated process. Instead of it going to a human being and that human being having to review it, it then mostly goes through quite quickly. Now this, I have no illusions that this will solve all problems, that this will prevent buggy applications from getting into Ubuntu. But do we really prevent that right now? No. You know, we, I, I'm sure you can all think of applications that have been released in Ubuntu that have largely not worked. So this does not purport to solve that problem. This solves the problem that we will make a best effort in preventing bad applications from getting in, but once they're in, we need a different tack. So we're in a position whereby developers are coming to us saying that they want to be able to push applications straight to users. You know, Firefox forced our hand. They were not happy with this model whereby we provide a bit of software and modify it and then deliver it to users. They wanted 
the product that they created going straight to their users. And we allowed them to do this because they're sufficiently large. But we should learn from that. Maybe it's really that all developers actually want this. Maybe they want to be able to stand on their own, to make their own mistakes, and speak directly to their users. So why don't we let them? How can we do that? Well, in the communication between developers and users, there's a rich amount of metadata being transferred back and forth. And we can leverage this metadata and change the sort order in Software Center so that the very best applications float to the top and the very worst applications are never even seen. We do this by taking the bug count of a particular application versus the number of users that have it installed. And if that ratio is particularly high, then the application floats to the top. If it's particularly low, the application floats to the bottom. We can do the same thing for crash reports. We could do more interesting things, like take the amount of time between a bug being reported and its fix actually going into Ubuntu. And again, if that's particularly high, then the application floats to the bottom. If it's particularly low, then the application floats to the top. And most users will never actually see the poor applications. So instead of the application selection being determined by individual Ubuntu developers making their best guess as to the reliability of a particular application, it becomes a vibrant marketplace determining what is good and what isn't. But that's not enough. We can solve those problems, right? Those are tractable problems and we know about them. And I'm sure we have all of our own ideas as to how we will do that. But again, we should have no illusions that we know all the problems. Because the simple fact of the matter is, right now we're not talking to our developers. We don't know what issues they have with our APIs. We don't know what their needs are. We don't know why, for example, they're choosing Android over us or iOS over us, or why they're even choosing us over those platforms. And until we actually start measuring that, until we actually start talking to our user base, we won't know that. So the other part of this is to actually do that. We need to engage with our developer community like we engage with our user base. So that we are creating a compelling platform, not for just end users to have the best experience, but developers as well, because developers are key to the end user's experience. So where does that leave us? So I said that we are going to kind of fundamentally shift the position of Ubuntu. Instead of being a downstream to the individual application developers, it then becomes an upstream. It provides a platform, an SDK to developers to create absolutely amazing applications for users. Those developers then provide us feedback and feature requests through the mechanism I just described. The developers then provide software directly to users through our Software Center platform as fast as web applications are deployed. Because at the end of the day, that is our competition moving forward. It needs to be that quick. Users at that same speed are able to provide bug reports back to developers. And this over here becomes a very tight feedback loop as opposed to this two to eight month wait on both ends. Users provide ratings and reviews and that other rich metadata that I talked about up to Ubuntu, and Ubuntu feeds that into the Software Center, and we provide those users, the operating system, and the Software Center platform to find the very best applications. So as Matthew said, you know, it's about what you do with it. It's not about how pretty it looks or the, the overall platform. It's about the applications that enrich your life and that's what this will do. And I hope you all have a think about this and, and talk to me and talk to other individuals and come up with your own ideas about how we solve these. Because again, if we are going to scale to hundreds of millions of users, we are not going to do so with human beings at every critical point in every juncture. Thank you.